Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Civil War once again and specifically focusing on transformations, ways in which the Civil War helps usher in a new era of American history. So the border states are an area that we've not spent a lot of time talking about, but it's important to understand that we do have four states that legally have slavery in 1861, but do not secede with the other 11 states that become the Confederacy. Um, these border states are part of the reason why when the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, it only applies to those states within the insurrection of the United States. So those that have left or attempted to leave and become part of the Confederacy. Um, why the 13th Amendment becomes ever so important is that in order to truly abolish slavery throughout the country, as we saw with the Dred Scott decision, there's going to have to be an amendment to do so. So those border states are gonna be areas in which we are gonna see a pretty equal split in terms of support between the Union and the Confederacy. Um, the state of Virginia will have its northern portion literally secede from it, and that is how the state of West Virginia comes into being um, during this time. Um, but Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri in 1861 were all states that had slavery, didn't leave the Union, and it's part of the reason why we will see this push truly to make abolition the law of the land when the Civil War ends. So one of the big issues that Lincoln faced is the fact that one, not everybody wanted Lincoln to be president, even in the North. Um, there were lots of Democrats, um, and many of those people became known as copperheads, as we spoke about before. They were seen as rather traitorous, the venomous snake that looks like that which is not venomous. It's a traitor in plain sight. And to deal with those people, Lincoln, we will see, will suspend habeas corpus. He will literally um, have people arrested. They are tried without out their presence or any kind of legal support and then sentenced. Um, and these are people who may have published material that was anti-Lincoln or anti-Union. They may have also been people who were giving actual um, money or military aid um, to the Confederacy. A total of over 13,000 people will actually find themselves imprisoned at some point um, because their behavior is deemed as traitorous. Um, the Supreme Court by the late 1860s will overturn all of these decisions. Um, but it's important to understand that Lincoln is try going to try to argue both sides. One, that there is not an official war and that these states of the Confederacy have not actually left the Union because that's impossible constitutionally. But he's also going to argue that the Fifth Amendment can be suspended because the country's engaged in war. And the Supreme Court says that that is simply not true. Lincoln wants to make sure that the border states are at least perceived to be in support of the Union. And so most of these suspensions of habeas corpus, these people who are imprisoned without trial, are actually going to come from those border states. Um, the case that decides that what Lincoln has done, ex parte Milligan, says essentially you can't use um, a military tribunal um, when there are civil courts. And this ex parte Milligan case um, will be used in the 20th and 21st century when talking about um, enemy combatants and people who might be imprisoned without trial um, due to um, what are perceived to be their actions against the United States. The Copperheads themselves um, were certainly seen by those who were Lincoln supporters, um, abolitionists, um, that essentially the Copperheads didn't actually have a way of resolving this conflict. They ultimately were going to allow the country to split in two. And there were some people who may not have even been tied to abolition in the same way 
as a, a William Lloyd Garrison would have been, where he wanted to see abolition across the country. There were people who were Republicans who just didn't want to see slavery in the West. But the idea that the Northern Democrats simply would appease the South and the South would continue to be a separate country, this Confederacy was just something um, that was untenable. The modern system of cash that, that you use um, actually evolves out of this time period. And so we had gone since 1833 with no essentially national bank, right? Going back to that Jackson period with the defunding of the bank during the bank war. And so as a nation, the union was going to have to raise a lot of money in order to fight this war. And so Congress will do a couple of things. It will create what are called the National Bank Acts, which essentially will empower Congress to be able to um, essentially set, um, sell bonds um, and also um, have the U.S. Treasury begin to print what they called greenbacks or that money that's in your pocket today. Um, these treasury notes were representative value. So a $20 note could be taken to any bank and substituted at that time for a one ounce gold coin. Also, the first federal income tax will be issued. Now, by the 1890s, this will be overturned. Um, the Supreme Court will say that the um, federal government is not empowered to tax individuals on their income um, or their assets. However, we will know, obviously, by the time we get into the 20th century, the 16th Amendment will be added to the Constitution, at which point Congress will have that power. And then we also will see a return to very high protective tariffs. And this kind of makes sense if you think about the fact that in both houses of Congress, except for Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, all of the other members of Congress that came from the states that seceded had left. And so you essentially had the Republican Party, a few Northern Democrats, all in charge of lawmaking. Um, and the Republican Party, many of those people are going to be like the Whigs of old. They are going to look towards protective tariffs in order to help American businesses. And that trend to see tariffs become higher and higher and higher to protect American industries will continue well into the 1890s. And they will return to a similar rate as they did um, back during that time of the um, tariff compromise of 1833. They're going to be somewhere um, uh, upwards of 40% of the price of a good. But in order to fight this war for four years, Lincoln and Congress are going to need money. Um, and so there is going to be an ever increasing amount of budget spent for defense. Um, they're going to continue to issue bonds, which essentially is debt to be paid back to the bondholders at some future point. And in order to have cash on hand, that's why we'll see things like a federal income tax. But government having a large budget um, and being able to get money, not just simply from the states, but also from individuals, um, that's something to some degree that we still see today. But where it's going to originate is in this time of the Civil War. Um, eventually, we will get to a place where the states themselves no longer make a taxable contribution, and that will come with the 16th Amendment. Lincoln is also going to face within the Union that there are people who begin to see this war as what is often called a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, meaning that the very wealthy, the people who could benefit the most from a prolonged conflict. So people who were in manufacturing and maybe we're manufacturing things like material for the army, uniforms and blankets, mess kits, tents, um, rifles, that those people were incented to see this war go on. But the people who actually went out and fought the battles, they were often relatively poor people. Um, and in places like New York City and Boston, they often were people who were quite recent immigrants. Literally, one could get off the boat from Ireland and in 1862, 1863, sign up to fight for the Union Army. Um, why would anyone do that? Well, there was suddenly you had pay that you might not have had before. Um, they even guaranteed citizenship. So there was this sense that as the war progressed, especially once the Enrollment Act or the draft 
so much like the Conscription Act that was passed by the Confederacy, that this was a noticeable difference between the classes. Um, if you were drafted and did not wish to fight, you could pay the government $300 in gold and they would find a substitute, a replacement. Um, $300 in gold would have been somewhere in the ballpark of 12 times the average person's salary of the day, annual salary. So the kinds of people who aren't going to go, probably the most famous example is a man named John D. Rockefeller, who we'll look at in unit six, um, who goes on to become one of the richest men of all time. Um, but he was the only son um, of a widowed mother and four, four sisters. And his mother believed selling all of her jewelry, mortgaging her house, whatever it took, so he could continue to be a student at college and not go and risk his life for this war was what was gonna economically benefit her family. Um, and she definitely wasn't wrong. But the fact was simply that the many people could not afford to do this. So those who couldn't afford to do it went and fought after 1863 and those who could well they didn't have to go by 1863 in new york city you are going to see that as it is today new york city um, is a place that's incredibly diverse and in the 1860s it had a large population of free blacks it had um, a large population of recent immigrants predominantly Irish um, and ultimately that meant it had a pretty large underclass compared to a lot of cities um, and there were concerns not only about this draft, which people were protesting, um, but also that as you saw more and more people um, who had left their condition of slavery and moved north into cities like New York, um, that it became harder for whites to find the same levels of employment and payment for their work. And this spilled over into what started as a draft riot and actually became a race war. Um, and to the point that more than 100 African Americans were lynched in New York City, um, a charity that existed for um, orphaned children of the free black population, the Colored Orphan Society, was burned to the ground and luckily all the children in it were saved. Um, but for almost a month, New York City had to have federal troops occupy it. It lived under martial law. So you can see that Lincoln has challenges, not only just with the Confederacy, trying to bring about victory, but internally in the Union, there are lots of people who are dissatisfied with the course of this war and wish to see it end sooner rather than later. With the war going on, it's important to realize that there's still lots of other work that Congress is going to continue to do, most of which is going to greatly transform and shape American life after the Civil War. And we're going to see that in three specific pieces of legislation. So the first one is in 1862, this Republican-controlled Congress is going to issue something called the Homestead Act. And it's based on some of the similar principles that we saw with the Northwest Ordinance, in 1787, but that now we're going to turn our eyes to land in the West, specifically what is in that Louisiana purchase. Um, and Americans could go and buy 160 acres of farmland for $10. Now again, that would be about a quarter of an average person's salary for a year. But if you work that land for five years, you would get to keep that land. Now, 60% of people who tried this didn't make the five years. Uh, most of the land, as we'll look at later on in uh, Unit 6, was west of something called the 100th Meridian. It had far less annual precipitation. There was limited ability to irrigate. Um, and so the majority of people who went out there um, were not successful. But for those who were, potentially they could start their lives again in the west for relatively little money. The second piece of legislation is something called the Moral Land Grant. And even you benefit today, many of you will, and maybe your siblings or parents have. Um, it said that land that states owned that they were willing to essentially 
turn over to the federal government for the purposes of investment to build colleges that would teach agricultural science and mining, they would have the opportunity to have a state university. Um, colleges today that were part of this moral land grant, um, NC State, um, the University of Colorado of Mines, um, there are lots of colleges, um, Texas A&M, that, that all were created out of this moral land grant for the next 50 years um, following its inception. Um, but pretty much anywhere that has a, it's a state college that has engineering, mining or agricultural science as part of its curriculum that was built after 1864 is a product of this moral land grant. And then the last piece of uh, legislation is the transcontinental railroad. So this is what people like Stephen Douglas were talking about in the 1850s. What was incenting him to want to create this Kansas-Nebraska Act is that he believed that the technology existed and that with the proper investment, you could connect from Atlantic to Pacific by a great network of railroads. And that transcontinental railroad, which will be the building of a railroad west from Council Bluffs, Iowa, all the way to California, um, will eventually happen. But its inception, its money, its original plans for funding will all come during the Civil War, but we won't see large scale construction of it begin until really the kind of the end of the Civil War. But several companies um, will be provided with some land grants. Um, they will be able to issue bonds. They will also um, have part of their investment um, repaid to them directly by the United States government. But ultimately, by 1867, we will have a railroad that spans the nation. And you can see, as I was speaking about those land grants, colleges, and universities, how many there are. Um, and some states have a great deal of them, and almost all of their uh, major places of education were sponsored out of this moral land grant. Um, others, maybe just one or two. But think about today the cost of college education, people who are able to um, live in a state and gain admission to a university that's at a lower cost, but teaches them important skills for their future employment. Again, this idea of investing in people for the purposes of greater democracy. So as the war um, goes on, we see that we have moved into essentially one of attrition. Um, the campaigns that are going to be led, particularly in the West, by people like Ulysses S. Grant, as he attempts to take um, the city of Vicksburg in order to gain control of the upper Mississippi, are going to be incredibly bloody. Again, with single battles, um, taking thousands of lives in a single day. Um, Sherman's March is actually going to be a far less bloody affair, but it is going to be one in which there is going to be a lot of physical destruction. Um, his army that's almost 40,000 people strong will capture Atlanta um, and continue to march to Savannah um, by Christmas of 1864 and then continue moving north to Columbia, South Carolina and then further north and east to what will eventually be Raleigh, where they will cease because by that point, um, the war itself is over in April of 1865. But this concept of taking the war to civilians, this idea of total war, is one in which this is a change from how war was fought in the past. Um, it was seen as, through much of the war, the traditional two um, armies meeting on a battlefield, especially with mechanization of weaponry, has now created high death tolls and essentially stalemates. And so this idea of total war, what will become trench warfare at the beginning of the 20th century, is all developed and seen as the tactics that will close out this modern type of warfare compared to how people fought in the past.
Lincoln himself is a complicated figure, in part because the hero or the way he is lionized today is certainly a place that he evolved into, but was not necessarily who he was, even in 1861. And the price to run the country and to win this war may have required Lincoln to sometimes do things that seem rather high-handed, if not outright undemocratic. Um, the political cartoon you see on your screen, the Federal Phoenix. Um, the Phoenix is a mythological creature um, that lives its lifespan and then as it disintegrates it eventually is consumed in flame and then born again. And our artists um, who drew for a magazine called Punch, um, which was an English magazine of the day, um, have Lincoln as this phoenix, as this bird who maybe is facing self-destruction and will somehow come out of the flames and be born again. And this was drawn um, just before and published just before um, the Electoral College um, certified the election um, that he faced off with George McClellan in 1864. But there were people who said in order for Lincoln to maintain his power, he had to at times violate the United States Constitution, limit the free press, um, essentially states' rights kind of went out the window, um, habeas corpus, overextension of credit for the purposes of funding a war. All of these things did actually happen. Um, and Lincoln was criticized quite openly for kind of overextending his power as the executive. And we can definitely see that for him, he found himself embroiled in a war. Um, he always argued that the actual physical altercation, the violence, did not start by the Union. It started by the Confederacy with their attack on Fort Sumter in April of 1861. The fact that they came out, um, they marched more than 15,000 men towards Washington, D.C., and met on the battlefield at Manassas, Virginia, which became the Battle of Bull Run in June of 1861. He said these were all actions taken by the Confederacy, um, that the Union Army, as it developed, took on its volunteers, um, that it was merely essentially defending what was this aggression and ultimately sought the goal of bringing the country back together. And obviously things may be slightly more nuanced than that. But in 1864, when Lincoln is seeking re-election, he is faced with really a, a problem in that he once again is really only running in the north. This time, it's not that he's not on the ballot in southern states, it's that they've seceded. So they don't even recognize that there is a presidential election going on. But Lincoln is facing off against George McClellan, who had served him um, as one of his chief generals early on in the war and then found himself dismissed, replaced, um, because he wasn't willing to conduct the war in the way that Lincoln wished. But Lincoln tried to make the election of 1824 a referendum about the future of the country, not what he had done as president over the last four years, but that he as leader was looking to bring about liberty, freedom for all people. And you can see the little schoolhouse and a rather diverse group of children coming from it. Um, he's thanking, shaking the hands of a man who has served in the military. But that his idea was that if you voted for him, you were voting for abolition. You were voting for a better America. Um, if you voted for George McClellan, well, McClellan was arguing that he as president would see stop the war. But in stopping the war, there would be two different countries. And Lincoln was able to capitalize on that and say, well, True, you will have no war and you'll have two different countries. And one of those countries you will allow to exist while it maintains the captivity of millions of people in slavery. And that was a pretty effective way of addressing the concern. So even people who had found themselves tiring of war after three years felt that in many ways that was a compelling argument. Um, we can see another way that that's being depicted that McClellan basically acknowledged that Lincoln and Jefferson Davis were creating two very different Americas. He says, if that's going to be the case anyway, let me be president and you can have it without war.
But that election of 1864, Lincoln certainly is going to be persuasive in his argument um, that if you vote for McClellan, you're voting to sanctify slavery somewhere else that used to be America. But he also benefited from the fact that Sherman was on the move and throughout um, the fall of 1864 had captured Atlanta um, and was successfully moving up um, the eastern coast of Georgia and essentially gaining control, physical control um, of that part of the South. Um, the North had already taken control of Tennessee um, prior to 1864. So by November, many Americans could actually see that the goals that Lincoln had set forth in 1861, it took some time, but they were coming to fruition. And you can see, though, we have a popular vote that the difference really is only about 10 percent. Yes, again, Lincoln's winning the big states with the large electoral numbers. But in terms of the popular vote, George McClellan was pretty popular, um, but Lincoln will prevail. Some other big changes in American life, things that we have with us today, um, and so I think they're important to address. Obviously, the abolition of slavery. Um, again, the Emancipation Proclamation is a, a, a military tactic in a lot of ways. It only freed enslaved people in those states currently in insurrection with the United States government, which meant that in an, oh, those border states, there were lots of enslaved people who still had not acquired their freedom. And so that is why the 13th Amendment, um, which was ratified in December of 1865, was so important. Um, we're at the time of the year where we talk about Thanksgiving. And there, obviously, Thanksgiving has been a tradition going all the way back um, to those early pilgrims who came to Plymouth in 1620. But the day that is a federal holiday today, um, that it was sanctified as something across the country that should be a day of rest, um, a day of appreciation. That is a decision that, again, Lincoln will make through executive order in November of 1862, um, in the aftermath of the terrible stalemate that was Antietam. Um, Lincoln felt that the country would benefit from having a day where there was no work um, and a day to kind of bring ourselves back to these older traditions in the founding of our nation. The draft, we've had it several times in American history. Um, it has not appeared since the early 1960s um, and during the Vietnam era, but we had not had a draft prior to 1863. So for about 100 years, it becomes the norm during specific times of armed conflict. Um, combat from a fixed position, so no longer to armies meeting on a battlefield, um, being able to fire at your enemy from a much greater distance, um, being able to use a single weapon um, and therefore a single soldier to potentially within seconds be able to repeatedly strike a target through a repeating rifle or what will become the Gatling gun or the machine gun, the mechanized warfare. We will see this grow tremendously. Um, in this time period. If you've ever heard the expression red tape, if you're trying to deal with the government, do your paperwork to get your driver's license and such, people sometimes describe it as red tape. And that comes from the fact that prior to the American Civil War, there was not a large role for the federal government in individuals' lives. Um, however, by taking in more than a million men in the Union Army um, with guaranteed pensions um, at a certain age or certainly some type of pension benefit to their widow, um, there now is a essentially a, a Bureau of Veterans Affairs. Um, and you had people who physically came to Washington, D.C. Um, to collect their money. All of their records were tied with red tape, red string, essentially. And so you would go to what was an office built specifically for that purpose. You'd give your name. It might take hours or days, but somebody would find your record. Um, and if you were entitled to a pension, you would get it. Um, 
having your mail delivered to your house. So prior to the Civil War, um, people typically went to a post office, and you still see this to some degree in some rural areas, very remote rural areas today. Um, but even in cities, your mail was not brought to you, you went to get your mail. Um, but it also became a place where you would be informed during the Civil War of casualties, deaths, missing in action. And that became something that was absolutely traumatic and horrific for the civilian population. After every major battle, you had, you know, women, wives, mothers, children who would gather by, in some cases, the thousands. Um, you also had people joining the war as whole families. So you would have a whole group of brothers and they would be in the same regiment. Um, you would have, you know, two city blocks in a city like New York City be much of what was an entire battalion of soldiers. And so if that entire group was involved in a specific battle, you could have a few neighborhoods where 30 or 40 percent or more of their young men had been wounded or killed. This worked very much against um, Lincoln's ability to justify the ongoing war. Um, and so the federal government decided one of the ways of dealing with this issue was that people would be individually notified about their loved ones um, and that they would not have to go pick up their mail, but their mail would be delivered to them. And then the last two things, what becomes um, medical care? during the time of the Civil War is going to change a great deal. So people had already kind of theorized um, what we call germ theory today. It did not have widespread practical application um, during the Civil War. Um, the vast majority of soldiers who died um, died from wounds or died from disease while serving in the army, not battlefield deaths. Um, but what becomes known as the U.S. Sanitary Commission um, will essentially become the medical corps. Um, they will create a whole contingent of nurses um, to take care of the wounded, um, not on the battlefield, but as they recuperated, um, returned um, to hospital for extensive stays for recovery. Um, the Sanitary Commission did allow women to fill certain roles as nursing, and you do see women um, in terms of the war effort taking on, again, these kind of maternal caring roles, the sort of gender roles of the day, but obviously ones that are far more in the public sphere relative to the private sphere. But an organization um, that still exists today, the American Red Cross, um, is born out of the U.S. Sanitary Commission um, because of a woman named Clara Barton. Um, she was a single woman unattached from a pretty well-off family. She had brothers who were serving in the military, and she wanted to serve as a nurse. But the U.S. Sanitary Commission, um, its nursing corps was run by Dorothea Dix, and Dorothea Dix believed that it needed to be married women, um, women who had already had some substantial commitment to some man in their life, maybe engagement or being widowed, um, because it would be inappropriate for single young ladies um, to be physically involved in the intimacy that is caring for the wounded. And Clara Barton couldn't be a part of that. Um, and she actually felt that as a single woman, she had no children to take care of. She actually was better composed for actually doing long-term service and service for men in the field. The American Red Cross, its goal was to actually go to battlefields to be able to provide care immediately. Um, and obviously that organization exists today, not only in the United States, but um, internationally as well. Um, but it's really the first time that you see women um, truly taking on um, this public sphere in ways that begin to rub against those traditional gender roles that we see developed throughout the era of the market revolution. So as we close out, a couple of things to consider. You know, we've gone through now almost five units of material. And if we look back, let's say, on unit four with President Jackson, we spoke about extension of executive power. And definitely we can see similar extensions of executive power with Lincoln as well. And so that's something to keep in mind. What makes these two presidents differ from so many others 
in this role of taking the power of the presidency and using it in unique ways. The other idea we want to come back to is the transformations of the Civil War. What aspects of the Civil War continue on today? So essentially, how is the Civil War itself a turning point in American history? And then the last thing is to take a look at Lincoln himself. So in historical memory up and through um, certainly the early 20th century, he was incredibly unpopular. Um, the Republican Party will continue to sort of burn a torch for him and laud him, but it really won't be until the 1950s or 60s that you begin to see the majority of Americans begin to look upon the historical Lincoln as someone whose legacy is invaluable um, to the progress of this country. And so it's important to consider what's going on publicly, culturally, for the hundred years following Lincoln's assassination that make his um, changes as president so profound.